morning. God is good. And all the time. Amen. The gospel prospers during the good times and the bad. Oftentimes more in the bad times because that's when we look around and realize and understand better than any other time how badly we need God. How much we rely on Him to get done what we cannot get done. If you want to turn your Bibles on or open them to Mark in chapter 10, we're going to, Lord willing, cover verses 35 through 45 this morning. And the title of the sermon, I hope, will make you scratch the side of your head a little bit. It's a little bit of play on words, but we're going to learn this morning from Scripture how to become better than others. Well, that seems kind of contrary to what the Bible teaches us, right? But I'm taken back to, uh, we, had, we had a sermon on pride several weeks ago, and my wife, I've told this story, not to y'all, but I've sto- told it several times throughout my life. My wife, after the service, said, I thought you would tell the old Mike Turner story. 
And I said, no, no, I, there's, there's a passage on down the line as we journey through the book of Mark where Mike Turner's story is going to be better. Now, I went to, uh, my wife and I both graduated from Murray State University with our undergrad, a great university. Our basketball team is 30 and 2, and we're already in the NCAA tournament. We don't have to wait for the selection show to find out. All right, so it's just a great school. We beat the Belmont Bruins, Sister Cameron, time and time again this year. I hate to tell you that. Um, and guess what? We're one of those picks that the Vols don't want to see on their bracket this, this morning. But I do, I do want to welcome the Cross Ministry from the University of Tennessee this morning. Thank you all for being with us. I told Sister Sarah, I told Sister Sarah when she called, it was a total, um, I'll say a God thing because... Um, uh, this sounds really like arrogant. I promise it's not like this, but I usually don't answer the phones in the office, but I answered, and it was her. And John started laughing because he was like, you never answer the phone. And so um, sure enough, she was there, but my mother, father, and older sister all got their masters at the University of Tennessee. So I grew up going to football games in Neyland Stadium and some basketball games at Thompson Bowling, and, and I get those chills even thinking about the band turning and saluting the hill before the football game. If, you, if you've never been to Knoxville, you don't know all of those cool things that go on there um, with sports. But anyway, I, was at, I, w I went to Murray State, and so I, I had this job with a basketball team, and I'll, I'll give you the, the end result is this. I was somewhere uh, uh, either like a student assistant coach when I was doing something really cool, like helping with a scouting report, but then I also sometimes was kind of like a head manager at the basketball team in this sense. The head coach occasionally would toss me the keys to his Cadillac, big fancy Cadillac, and said, Hey, Jay, run this down to the dealership. Don't tell them that I want a new Cadillac. Yes, sir. So I would drive his Cadillac to the Cadillac dealership. I would go in. I bypassed all the salesmen and the general manager, and I would tell, I forget what it is, Mr. Wynn, I think it was. Mr. Wynn, Coach Anderson wants a new Cadillac. All right, we'll tell whoever to get him a new Cadillac. And then I would drive his new Cadillac back to him. But I was only about 19 years old, and I was at Murray State, and, and there was this man named Mike Turner. He's from Nashville, Tennessee. He's 6'9", 240, strong as an ox man, and he was very involved in a very devout Christian. He still is to this day in ministry. And Mike's older brother had played in the NBA, but, but Mike was just a really good man. And, and I remember, after being around him for maybe a year, year and a half, putting my arm around him and saying, Mike, I've got to tell you, the, um, I'm just really impressed by you. Now, this man's older than me, but I'm just really impressed. You, you, you just, you, you live right. You tell people about Jesus. All of, you know, I was just really laying it on. And I said, you know, what is it about you? And he looked down at me and he said, Jay, my humility makes me better than everyone else. <laughs> what? What would you say? Your humility makes you better than everyone else. I don't really, I don't get it. So I was like, well, you know, what is humility? You know, it's a, mod a modest opinion or estimate of one's own importance or rank. And I can't help but think that recently, not, not very long before I had asked Mike that question, he had had some interaction with Mark in chapter 10. And he had come to realize that one of the things that separated him from most men's college basketball players, especially at the Division I level at a big basketball school like Murray State. I say big, it's only 10, 12,000 students, but the, where basketball is really important is that he was humble. He knew he wasn't really better than anybody else. And it took him a long way. So as we have some opening thoughts today, I want to bring you, you know, this term that you've heard before, but if you've grown up around church, you know churches have deacons, right? All right, that's, that's a, a biblical office, and it talks about it in the Bible, and so different churches look at the role of deacons in a different way. We're not going to get into that this morning. But diakonos, it's a Greek word, and, and we, we translate it servant. But if we wanted to go a little bit even more narrow, all right, these deacons, that's our English word for it we'll go with, is it's one who waits tables. Now, you might have heard that before, and if you live in Panama City Beach, you know that people who wait tables can make big money in Panama City Beach, all right? They, they really can make a really healthy, good living. But the point is not necessarily that. The point is this, a willingness to come in and serve others and be below them, to look at them and say, I need you to have what you need, and I'm giving my life for that purpose. 
Now there's another word in, in, in the Bible that I want to make sure we talk about and that we understand when we talk about serving others and humility. And that's doulos. And the Bible sometimes will, will translate that word as servant. But I want to make sure you understand something if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. We talk about the freedom that Jesus gives us all the time. And praise God we have freedom because we are in Christ. And we don't, have to, we don't have to follow the letter of the law. And we don't have to worry about this or that. And we don't have to worry about having our hand cut off anymore. All of those are great things. But make no mistake about it. The Bible teaches us that if we have put faith in Jesus, we are called to be a slave to Jesus Christ. We try to avoid that term because of we don't want to be insensitive to the United States of America over the last several hundred years. But the Bible was written long before the United States of America existed. We are called to look at Jesus Christ and say, you are our master. Everything that you have commanded, I am going to do because I'm totally reliant on you for my life. I want to thank you guys. When I had that sermon, when we had that sermon about pride several weeks ago, y'all took it like a champ. Great responses. And then I also want to compliment you last week. It was an honor to get to be the pastor as we celebrated 25 years on this property. I really enjoyed that. And I want to compliment y'all on the way that people that are members of this church stepped up and served. I saw members of our church telling others, no, you get your food before us. I saw people serving. I had people calling that week. How can I help? during the party after church on Sunday. And it meant a lot to me because it means that we have believers here at the church at the beach that get it. As a church, it's about us serving and loving on other people. So I want to thank you for that attitude and that response in the last, say, let's say month and a half on a couple of different occasions that we've had here. Now I want you to know as we get into the text that the apostles didn't get it. Just like us sometimes. They had been taught things several times, and they were knuckleheads. And guess what? We're knuckleheads too. So they were slow learners. Eventually they would get it, but it's going to be several years from right now in the story before the apostles start to get it. And two, they've had, they had had this argument that we know of three times. Now, this is the second one. The third one happens the night of the, the Last Supper, okay, with Jesus. But they, have, they keep having this argument about who would be the greatest. Who would receive the, the, the place of high position and authority in the kingdom one day? And they argue about it. And we can try to, we can try to act like we're better than that, but are we? You know, if we're not careful, we will see somebody starving and dying over here and wonder why God let us stump our toe on the, on the bedpost this morning. Well, boy, we must think that we're pretty cool and pretty good if we think our big toe is so much better than that other person's survivor. So I'm not for sure we're all that different than the apostles are. You know, Jesus had been telling them, hey, I'm going to die. We're going to Jerusalem. We're going to Jerusalem for me to die. I'm going to rise on the third day. And they would turn around and say, oh, that's cool. Hey, I'm going to be better than you in the kingdom one day. What? If you were Jesus, wouldn't you just kind of want to backhand them every once in a while? <laughs> Obviously, Jesus is handling this better than I would if I would have been in his boat. But these first few verses, let's look at man's approach to relationships and relating to others. Mark in chapter 10, verse 35, 36, and 37. Man's approach to things. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus, saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And Jesus said to them, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant us that we may sit, one on your right side and the other on your left, in your glory. So Mark, he, adds, uh, he, he, he doesn't put this part in there, but we know from Matthew and maybe John as well that really James and John brought their mama with them too. And there's a chance that Salome was actually related to Jesus' mother, Mary. And so they come, and they're kind of trying to pull the family card. Now, I want to make sure you know that whenever Jesus asks a question in Scripture, it's not because he needs information. Jesus, fully God, is omniscient. He knows everything. 
So he doesn't need to know, but yet, for dialogue and teaching lessons and allowing people to progress and grow, he asks questions and he goes back and forth with people at times. Jesus had just told them of his death, and now they're coming back with their mama, his closest friends, along with Peter, and, and most of the time Peter's brother Andrew. And yeah, you're going to die, but can, can we be up front? That'd be really cool if we were up front. So they didn't get it. You know, a, a really, now he was really wrong about some things. He was really right about other things. But he was a brilliant thinker and Christian theologian. John Calvin, as I was studying this week, I found this quote by him. Holy zeal is often accompanied by personal ambition. You see, Peter, James, John, several of the other apostles, they had holy zeal. They were all about Jesus. But deep down inside of them, they wanted to get to the top. And if we're not careful, we'll do the same thing. And we will try to act like when it comes to kingdom stuff that we are better than others. I'll never forget as a kid growing up in church, daddy would call on somebody to pray. And I might do this too. And if I do, I'm sorry. I promise I never try to do this. But I'll say Brother Ted because Brother Ted really wasn't like this. But Brother Ted would stand up and he would kind of position himself and he would, he would kind of get all like this. And Brother Ted would say, Father God. We thank you for the many blessings. That... And I was a little kid, and I'd just been out, and, and, and now I didn't cut tobacco because that's too hard to work for me, but, but the, I've just seen Brother Ted out in the tobacco field, and that's not how he talks. And so, so I remember being a little kid and hoping that Dad wasn't looking at me because he would whip me if he knew I had my eyes open when we were praying. But I'd be like, is that Brother Ted over there praying like that? He had some holy zeal. And I guess it's because he had some personal ambition for others to think maybe a little more about him than what really there was. And Brother Ted really wasn't like that, but there were a couple like that, and so I'm sparing you their names in case they're watching on Facebook or YouTube this morning. <laughs> they know who they are. <laughs> Verses 38 through 40. So we've seen man's approach, and now we see how dangerous man's belief in himself or herself can be. If you would, join with me here, verse 38. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? This is dangerous territory right here for James and John. They said to him, we are able so Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink the cup that I drink, and with the baptism I am baptized, with you will be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared. James and John, they, they hadn't learned this lesson, and I probably could have put this at the end, but I'm going to go ahead and share this with you. It's very important that if you want to move forward in God's kingdom, if you want to grow closer to Him, if you want to be more the way that God desires for you to be, this is a great lesson for you. You gain kingdom power by giving up earthly power. It almost doesn't make sense. It's paradoxical, right? But if you want to grow in the kingdom, you have to let go of these earthly things that you're holding so tight to and trying to control because you think they're so important to your existence, and to your future. So Jesus, in these verses, what he was really asking is, all right, old boys, are you able to suffer and die for the kingdom? And they replied that they were. Jesus, in so many words that we have quoted by Mark, says, well, it's going to happen to me. And Christ says, okay, boys, since you say you're able, I want you to know that it is going to happen to you. James was the first martyr. John ends up exiled on an island out in the Mediterranean Sea. They did suffer like Christ suffered. Now one thing that I want to touch on in this verse, because we can get this wrong theologically, and so here we are, every once in a while I kind of stop and I say, okay, we're going to go a little deeper for a second. We're going to go a little deeper for just a second. We see in this that God the Son showed submission to the will of God the Father. But we need to explain that because if we're not careful, we'll get out of bounds on that thought. 
See, sometimes people will try to teach you that there's a pecking order. That God the Father is the most important, then God the Son is below Him and the second most important, and then the Holy Spirit is third most important. And there's some type of hierarchy. And that's simply not true. God the Father, God. God the Son is God. God the Holy Spirit is God. We refer to it as the Trinity. Make no mistake, it takes faith and it is hard to understand and can never be totally comprehended on this side of glory. But there is no instance in which the Holy Spirit is not absolutely 100% fully God. If he ever wasn't, then he wouldn't be God anymore. If Jesus ever did away with his deity, he was no longer Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one that God had sent and planned for. And so how does this kind of go together? I think it's important that we understand that there is some type of submission, but the easiest way to probably understand it is through salvation. We have God the Father, we have his love, and we have his power, and he sends God the Son who comes and God the Son had to do the work of dying on the cross and rising again. And then we have the Holy Spirit. And in the Holy Spirit's work, the Holy Spirit regenerates hearts, touches. Brother Barry sang the song earlier, He touched me. Well, who touched you? The Holy Spirit, God Himself, touched you and regenerated your heart. You were born again and you were able to repent and believe. And when you did that, your sins were washed away. He touched you. The Holy Spirit regenerated your heart. And then the Holy Spirit is a guarantee or a seal that keeps you locked in to God. It is by His power, not your power, that you are saved. And you see, so they, they have different roles in order to get God's job done. But they absolutely, positively, all persons, all three persons of the triune God are 100% fully and equally God. So let's continue to move forward in verses 41 and 42. We see some results when we do things man's way by wanting glory instead of doing things God's way and being a servant. Verse 41, and when the ten heard it, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them to himself and said to them, you know that these who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. So James and John are sitting there. They've even been, brought Mama up to Jesus, and they want these places in glory, these special places. And the other ten, outside of them, are getting ticked off with them. Hey, what are you doing asking for special places? We're just as important as you are. We've given up everything in our life just like you've given up everything in your life. And so Jesus is over there, I'm sure, with his face in his hands saying, Oh, my goodness. So he calls these knuckleheads together because it's time to teach them a lesson. He says these people that you're around all the time, these Gentiles, when they rise to a place of stature, they lord it over you and they act like they're better than you and that's not the way it goes in God's kingdom. It's absolutely not the way it goes. And Jesus is passionate about that. And he wants to make sure we understand that this morning. Verses 43 and through 45. We see God's answer in God's way right here. 43, 44, and 45. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Son of Man, Jesus' favorite title for himself, used over 80 times in the Bible. Why did he love that? Because he was trying to get the point across to his followers. He knew we would be reading it thousands of years later. It's about humility and serving others in the kingdom. It's not about being the biggest and the baddest with all the power and the glory. I want to read verse 45 again. For even the Son of Man, Jesus talking, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Ransom. Just to make sure we know a few little things about that. It's the price of release. It's the price that Jesus had to pay for your sin to be forgiven. 
and not to have you locked up anymore. There's a Greek word, word, antipolon, actually it's two words. And when it's translated, it can be translated for many, but it can be translated from the Greek into English as in place of. You see, Jesus paid the price in place of you. Jesus paid the price in place of me. For all that believe and profess that Jesus is Lord, whosoever will, Jesus paid the price in place of us. So there's some related concepts, substitutionary atonement, or might be called penal substitution. Either way, they're words that you need to know, church. And the next time that you look at the cross, as we approach Easter over the next month, we see Jesus, and we understand, yes, I believe this, I believe that, yep, 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 okay, I'm saved, that's good, let's go get a, a, be, be good people. Okay, yeah, that's great. Let's play some patty cake and bake some brownies and kumbaya. But when you see the cross as we approach Easter, what we need to see is the fact that Jesus, 2,000 years ago, was hanging there so that we don't have to. He was a substitute, a willing substitute for our sin to be forgiven. Now, how will all this transform our life? We have fake hustle and we have real hustle. I want to tell a little basketball story. We're in March Madness right now. I don't think he's going to watch. And so the, uh, one of my teammates in high school, his name was Chad. Chad was a decent little player. But he suffered from fake hustle. This is the out-of-bounds line. Here's the basketball. It's, it goes into the third row of the stands. And Chad would come running out of nowhere. The, probably the referee's already blown the whistle and pointed which direction. And Chad goes sliding on the floor for the loose ball. Chad, why you do that, man? The, the ball's already like way up there in the stands. Nobody thinks you're going to be able to go get it. And that's all fine and dandy, the fake hustle then, but here's what happens with fake humility and fake hustle in another aspect. The other team has somebody there, and there's a loose ball there, but Chad's 50 feet away. And the other team goes, and they pick up the basketball, and here comes Chad with his fake hustle, and he dives on the floor for the loose ball, and he goes sliding, and everybody's like, oh, what great hustle, that's great hustle, Chad, way to go, Chad. And guess what? The other four of us are down there, and they got five guys coming at four of us, and we're like, oh, no, what are we going to do to stop them? You see, the same thing can happen if we have fake humility. We've been around people like that, right? And we, none of us like it. None of us like those folks. See, fake hustle, we'll have to put everybody else in a bind. Fake humility puts the rest of us Christians in a bind. Don't fake it. Own it. Make yourself better than others because of your humility. See, as Christians, we must have a change of our worldview. And I'll end with this. It's not even so much about worrying about if you are at the top of the ladder or if you are at the bottom of the ladder. See, the world has always had smart and dumb. The world has always had rich and poor. The world has always had cool people and uncool people. But what we've got to come to grips with is that we've got to get to where, no matter where we are on the ladder, we come in and we serve the people at the bottom. If we'll change our worldview to where we look out and we see him and her and this person and that person, and we don't just say it, but we truly believe that person is more important than we are. Because I don't even know if that person knows Jesus then all of a sudden we'll become who Christ is trying to teach the apostles to be. And when you do that, your life gets so good that you can't stand it because you're going to be in his will, not your own.
make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turns.